Okay, folks, uh, this is unfortunately the third or fourth time I'm trying this, hopefully working out all the kinks. Uh, welcome to the first online lecture for COM 411. I hope that everyone is safe and well, um, that you are yeah, surrounded by people that you care about and you're taking care of yourself. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what this online class is going to look like before I do that. Of course, I have to give you a dad joke. This is also on Flipgrid, which I hope you're all logging into and recording videos on. I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Today's dad joke interviewer. Where do you see yourself in five years? Me. Listening. I would say listening is my biggest weakness. I can uh, just see Danielle's eyes rolling uh, when I read that. Um, so what the, is this online com 411 going to look like? Uh, first, it's going to be, I, I sent an email, hopefully everyone received it. Uh, it outlines kind of my vision for what the class is going to look like. The, the main ideas are that it's going to be uh, asynchronous. You know, I know that all of you have various sets of uh, circumstances and stresses that may make it difficult to have a, you know, a class in like one big Zoom session. Excuse me, I wish we could do that. It would, I, I really want to, to be interactive and, and wish we could still you know, keep that. But these are you know, desperate circumstances and we're gonna do what we can to, um, I wanna do what I can to help make it so that you can be successful in you know, fitting this class into your life. Um, whatever uh, you know, difficulties and kind of constraints you have right now. So one tool for doing that that I hope will help us to get some of the benefits um, of uh, interaction is Flipgrid. It's uh, this video chat system. I've not used it before, but it, it looks pretty good. So you can um, respond to each other with videos. I put up a few. I encourage you uh, to, in fact, encourage you by requiring it to every week uh, on by Friday. So all assignments will be due Friday at five to talk about uh, a couple of things you learned and one thing you're still confused about and to respond to each other's videos. It hopefully can be kind of a become a nice space for us to interact with each other. Um, th there will also be assignments. Uh, typically, we'll always do Friday at five and, and typically every week. I'll try and make an assignment. Uh, and then readings and resources. The assignments and the readings and resources will be available by uh, Monday. That's my uh, strong goal. This week was an exception. Um, I'm just getting this out to you today. Um, but that's the, the general plan. And then you'll kind of have the week, however you wanna use uh, your time during the week to, to do the readings, look through the resources, including short lectures like this. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about today about the assignment that's due this Friday. It's a, it's a difficult assignment. I know that it is. I hope that you worked on it at least some over the break uh, to, to help to make this a little more accessible. Um, you know, I, I really wish we would have had more in-class time to go over R. I know it's difficult. Um, I encourage you to reach out to me, come to the office hours, email me to schedule other office hours. You know, I, I, uh, I have flexible time. I don't wanna just sit in front of a computer, so I scheduled limited office hours. But if you wanna make an appointment, if you're struggling with R, make an appointment and let's work through it together and figure this out. So, but, uh, but one thing that I, I done to make this assignment a little easier and hopefully help with R is I put up an example of kind of what an A plus project would look like with some network visualizations um, th part of this was to show you kind of what, yeah, what this project would be ideally in my mind. Um, and second was to also literally give you code that you could use and build on. So please, you know, look at my code, do your best, um, build on it for the questions that, y that you're interested in. I show how to color nodes differently. I show how to um, color edges differently, um, et cetera. So hopefully that is helpful. Hopefully you've worked through problems and getting R installed on your computers. I know there are one or two of you who are still having difficulties and I'm happy to kind of keep working through that and, and be flexible. Um, that's another kind of general principle from now is, is I'm gonna to try to be very flexible with the, with the way things work and we'll just kind of try and make it through this together. Okay, um, the principles I wanted to talk about today are around diffusion and contagion. So the idea of social diffusion or network diffusion uh, the, is that we are influenced, what we do and what we believe is influenced by what others do. Uh, and what we see around us. That's the big idea. Um, and in many cases, this actually makes a lot of sense. Um, it makes sense just from an individual perspective. 
uh, because often uh, our view of the world is limited. And by taking in input from others, by looking at what they're doing, we can learn something about how they see the world and, and different information that we don't have. Um, and so often it's really a useful heuristic to just do what other people are doing or to believe what they're doing because often they are correct. Um, so I think uh, it, it makes a lot of sense as a heuristic. Um, there's also reasons, for example, some, some things, some not beliefs so much, but well, kind of. Uh, actions have what's called network effects. And the idea of network effects is that something becomes more valuable the more people adopt it. And so something like a standard, um, a plug, for example, uh, that if every house, the builder had to decide what type of plug to use, you know, how wide it should be and what the voltage should be, it would just be a nightmare. Um, that by standardizing, it didn't really matter what our standard was. In fact, there are different plugs across different countries, which, which is its own kind of pain. But within a country, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, it would make sense universally as well, but it makes a lot of sense within a country to have the same standard. That way, every electronics equipment manufacturer knows what uh, standard to use. They know how to produce it for it, and, and there's not questions about it. Languages are another example, that it's not that English is the best language. It certainly is not by a lot of metrics. Um, it's very difficult to spell. Pronunciation is difficult in, in many regards. Um, but the fact that we have a common language, um, certainly within a country, and, and English has become sort of a lingua franca um, because it's so useful to have something that you know other people will know. The more people know a language, the more useful it becomes. And uh, technologies are another one. If all your friends are on Snapchat, it becomes more valuable. The more of your friends are there, the more difficult it is for you to not go use it, uh, even if you might dislike it. But it has value because there are more people using it. So those are network effects. Other things, you know, like beliefs, don't go along with network effects. But like I said, it, it may often make sense. Uh, they don't have network effects, sorry, but it may often make sense to change our beliefs based on what other people believe. And we'll talk about how that happens in a second. Uh, we often think of Diffusion and contagion are happening in a couple of ways. There are a few papers that, that argue about for this distinction. One is things that, that undergo simple contagion. So where the, the idea of simple contagion is that one person can spread it to one person. Uh, one, one contact is enough. So things like coronavirus are, are um, spread through simple contagion. It only takes one person who has coronavirus to give it to you. Um, and these sorts of things are of course difficult to stop but they're even more difficult to stop depending on the network type and so in for example a small world network which is similar to the the world that we live in uh, our contact networks where most of the contacts we have are those people that we work with and our friends a very small group of people but once in a while people make these long uh, leaps right and so uh, clustered but with uh, long some long distance edges and in those scenarios, it's really hard to stop simple contagion to happen. And, and we're all living through that difficulty right now. Most of the interventions that we would like to take or that, that the CDC wants to take or, or the WHO are or can be understood as network interventions. So, for example, uh, when China locked down Wuhan uh, and when the U.S. and China uh, stopped travelers from moving between countries, um, this is an attempt to block these long ties, right? That, that understanding that it's really difficult to stop clusters from uh, spreading something. But if we can stop the long ties, we can stop it from spreading to other clusters. Second, things like social distancing and sheltering in place are attempts to reduce the de degree distribution. So this can help both with within cluster and between cluster uh, transmission of something. So we're just trying to slow down uh, to you know, get rid of edges, basically, if you th can think of it as a, as a network. We're trying to just get rid of as many edges as we can so that it slows down how quickly things move or this virus moves through the network. So that's simple contagion. And the most important, if we think of, of how this thing moves, the most important places to focus our attention are on those with high between and centrality. So people where that are uh, moving things between clusters. Um, and if we could stop them, that would be, uh, that's the kind of the most bang for your buck. We'll talk a little bit more about, about that in a second and Duncan Watts' uh, view on that. Uh, so the other approach, the other, uh, sorry, main idea of uh, how things flow is complex contagion. And so most things 
uh, that flow through communication or influenced by communication in social networks, uh, I would argue are uh, complex contagion uh, or, or only spread through complex contagion. And this is, you know, that we don't change our beliefs or our behavior typically just from the influence of one other person. That uh, one friend who starts, you know, using Snapchat is typically not enough for us to start using it just because they do. Um, that one person who's, you know, takes up a new hobby is not enough for us. You know, that, that if your friend really starts getting into the lacrosse team, uh, that doesn't make you want to do it. But if all of a sudden all of your friends took up lacrosse or all of your friends started, you know, downloaded Snapchat and start, and we're on it all the time. Uh, I mean, in some cases the, with Snapchat, it's, that's kind of a network effect, but even, uh, for lacrosse, it's sort of there are there are reasons that we might change our behavior to uh, to fit in, for example. But also, we might actually change our beliefs. So while the coronavirus is a simple contagion, our beliefs about what to do about it are a complex contagion. That that we might think social distancing is a good idea, but if no one around us is doing it, if we're at the Florida beaches, which I hope that none of you were and we see that everyone is just treating it like business as usual and playing and you know, hanging out on the beach, then we might think that this isn't actually a big deal. We, th we had thought it was a big deal, but now that I see how everyone else is asking, acting, it must not be. And so uh, we are influenced by other people and by multiple other people. One person acting different from the crowd is usually not enough. It takes multiple people to kind of help us to change our beliefs or behavior about something. And we're very easily influenced in this way. Uh, so these, the definition is they require multiple ties between groups in order to, or uh, between people, and therefore multiple ties between groups. And in fact, many ties between groups often because you need an individual to be seen by at least two people. And so it's much more difficult for things to, for complex contagious things to move between groups and to move across the world. Um, so that's one explanation for why we see things uh, you know, groups that can persist in having different beliefs or different ways of seeing the world. Uh, while we don't see, you know, a country or a, a religious community that just didn't get coronavirus. Um, it's much, uh, not only because it's much easier, but because these things can travel so quickly across groups, um, even with, with just minimal contact. Okay, so those are the main ideas. I, I also wanted to talk just for a minute um, about Duncan Watts's reading. So we had two readings. Uh, I, I don't remember, I think I did yet bring up in this version, my, my, this attempt at, these, uh, at this lecture, that I, had, I did an interview with Josh Becker, the author of one of our papers. I did an interview this morning, uh, put it on YouTube, and also put it on our wiki. I strongly encourage you to watch it. Um, and so I'm not gonna talk about that reading. We talked in that interview about that. But the other reading was from Duncan Watson. The main idea that I wanted you to get from it is this idea that, um, well, like, like thinking about understanding how information uh, cascades or information moves through a network. That thinking about his argument, his, his the context is thinking about, you know, how can we can we predict when cascades will occur? When a tweet is going to go viral, for example, are there as as um, Malcolm Gladwell argued, people who are influencers, that just whatever they say becomes popular. Um, and Duncan Watts says probably not. Uh, he says that if we looked in hindsight, a, a viral tweet seems perfect. It seems ideal and perfectly suited. And of course it went viral because look how funny it is or look how appropriate it is or look how it you know, calls out this person in just the right way. Um, but in reality, there were likely at that same time hundreds or thousands of similar tweets with that were just as funny, just as appropriate, that could have gone viral instead. Um, and so his argument is that the luck plus the changing network structure matters more than the attributes of the information or the people who spread the information. And he gives the example of a uh, forest fire, that if a forest fire happens, we don't go back and say, what was it about the spark that was so important? So why was the spark so different and better than the other sparks or more fiery than the other sparks? Uh, because we know that it's the, the nature of the forest, that the forest was dry, the forest was ready to respond to a spark, any spark, and that that's what led to virality. 
Um, and I think he, he takes this point a little too far at times, but I think it's a really good one. I think it's a, overall a really good point that when we look in hindsight, we might think that something um, caused, you know, we can see the causal direction. Why it was viral is because it was so good. But the really much of it is about the structure itself. And one way we know this is because it's so difficult to predict which tweets will go viral in the future. Even while it's much more likely that Barack Obama's or Kim Kardashian's tweets will, will gain a lot of attention and go viral, we still, even if we know everything about the individual and we read the tweet and we know how good it is, it's still really difficult to predict which ones will, will go viral and which won't. And I'm sure all of us have uh, experienced that, that you write something that you think is just so clever and so wonderful and you uh, send it out and no one engages with it. Or sometimes you write something you know, off the cuff that seems silly and it just uh, you know, gets a lot of attention. Um, and so a lot of it, the argument is, that is just uh, the unpredictability of the world and of social networks. Okay, so that's his main idea. Um, and that there's a video, that actually a video online. I put a few extra resources on. There's one about sources of homophily that's really good by a professor uh, at Maine. And then there's a Duncan Watts TED Talk on common sense and kind of some of these ideas that were brought up in the, in the chapter. And like I mentioned, the, the third thing which I really want you to watch is my video with Josh Becker. He really helps to, to explain these ideas of collective intelligence and uh, wisdom of the crowds and his paper. Um, he's really cool, really bright, and I think you'll really enjoy the video. So uh, thanks. Uh, I hope this worked out okay. I'm happy to hear feedback. Please tell me how this went, what it could be done better. Stay safe, stay home, um, and look out for each other. Think about especially people who are vulnerable and, uh, and how we can all help each other make it through this. All right. I, hope, I look forward to hearing from you. I'll, check, I'll be checking Flipgrid. I'll be checking uh, Brightspace. Um, and please keep in touch, come to office hours, and let's make it through this together. All right, bye.